Okay, thank you for coming along to this session on the challenges and opportunities of fibre shared in the UK. And thank you to Groundswell for inviting us back again. We did a Zoom last year with Rebecca Burgess, which was very thrilling, but it's really exciting to be here in person and to see you. Um, before I start the session, I would really like to honour the indigenous origins of many of the practices currently used in the regenerative movement. Indigenous people compromise just 5% of the global population, and yet they protect eight, over 80% of the world's biodiversity, and that's in the face of incredible challenges. So I think it behoves us all to support them, because we obviously have a lot to learn. Um, so the projects we're going to share are from South East England Fibre Shed, but the challenges are common to anybody working in the UK. And wherever you're from, we hope you'll find it useful. My name's Deborah. I'm the co-founder of the South East England Fibre Shed, along with Gala and Harriet Miller, who should have been here, but unfortunately, due to work commitments, can't join us. So very kindly, Phoebe English has allowed her studio manager, Clara, to come and join us today. Um, I'm also the director of Field and Folk, an, artist, uh, an artisan design studio consultancy working in East Sussex with regenerative plants and fibres. So I'm just going to hand over quickly to Gala and Clara to introduce themselves. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi everyone, uh, my name is Clara, I'm the studio and production manager at Phoebe English Studio and I'm going to be presenting that project that I've been managing alongside Phoebe, uh, collaborating with the South East Fibership England. Hi, I'm Gala, I'm from Port Hatch Farm in Sussex, and um, I'm going to be talking about the work I've done with the flock producing more products. So I'm going to start with a brief introduction to Fibre Shed and give an overview of what we're doing in the South East England, and apologies to those of you who already know, I know some of you in the audience are familiar with the idea of the Fibre Shed, but I just wanted to be clear of what we're talking about. So this um, slide here is basically where we're getting most of our illustrates where we're getting most of our clothes from at the moment so over 60 percent of all the clothes worn are polyester um the bane of our life are fleeces which are called fleeces but of course are totally fossil fuel so one of the things we'd love to do is to try and produce a wool fleece um and i think it, it we haven't been paying the same attention to what we put on our body in on our bodies as we put in our bodies and a lot of people aren't aware that the chemicals that go on our bodies are not regulated to anything like the same degree as the chemicals that go in our bodies. And it's not untypical for a piece of clothing that you're wearing to have literally a thousand different chemicals which are shedding, particularly the microfibers, which are shedding as we wear them, as well as when they're washed. And the majority of our, pop, um, our oil is also coming from conflict zones. And in 2015, the Alan MacArthur Foundation estimated that 98 million tonnes of oil were used in the textile industry, which has increased every year. But just as we've recognised that in our industrial food system, the answer is to go back to regenerative farming, to look to local systems and local growers, it's the same with the fibre shed. And this... Uh, lost my... <laughs> uh, this slide here um, is the soil to soil textile and this is the this shows really the, the idea behind the um, fibre shed. So in 2011 Re Rebecca Burgess decided to create a challenge and sort of in inspired by um, what she had seen in indigenous communities and artisan communities around the world trying to preserve the resources for future generations. She looked to create a clothing from within this, what she called a fibre shed, the people and the ge geographical area, playing on the word watershed, within 150 miles of her um, home in California. There are now 42 fibre sheds globally, the majority in America, one in India, and several in Europe. And we decided that the focus for the Southeast should be to connect farmers and independent growers with the design community in the southeast, and particularly in London. Many, many people are unaware that London has actually got a lot of makers and a lot of making capacity, as well as the northwest of England. And there's an incredible awareness in young designers of um, the problems with the fashion industry and wanting to reconnect with local fibres. So what all fibre sheds have in common, wherever they're based, is that they work with local labour, local fibres and local dyes, 
and a commitment to soil-to-soil -soil processes. So this map here shows the areas that we cover, and I just chose the regional um, definition as used by the government with a view to potential funding in the future. Um, and like most fibre sheds, we're on a voluntary basis. We affiliated to the US fibre shed in autumn 2019. I give one day a week and pay for all the office costs and uh, Wi-Fi website, etc. And Gala and Harriet's knowledge and expertise in farming and knitwear is really helpful in developing our strategy and vision for the fibre shed. And although I've been successful in securing funding for projects, I've not been able to access funding for developing the website and setting up the members database, which is where the real value of the fibre shed comes from and allows people to connect. So if there's anybody in the audience who has ideas for that, would be really grateful. And that is a common problem to all fibre sheds. Um, at the moment, we don't have a legal entity. We're affiliated to the American Fibre Shed, which is a not-for-profit that comes with certain um, rules and regulations, but we will probably at some point incorporate as a CAC. So the resources that we have in the southeast region, um, London is a centre, as I said, for design and small batch manufacturing, and there's been a lot of interest from brands emailing who want to work with or source local regenerative fibre. But the issue is that brands are used to coming to someone and buying something off the shelf, and the conversation, every conversation I have is a step nearer to getting to understand that they have to work with the farming season and natural seasons. And we also have real issues with the time scale for producing wool and for uh, people who want to produce small batches of wool in the UK. Um, there's also a lot of interest from farmers wanting to grow flax and hemp and interest with, from designers wanting to work with those materials. But we currently have no infrastructure for processing or weaving with hemp or linen or flax to make linen. And sadly, the last linen mill that was weaving in Scotland has just closed. Um, having said that, if there are any farmers in the audience growing organic hemp, flax or nettle, I'm occasionally approached by um, mills who want to source that material and process on the continent where they do have that infrastructure. So please do come find me afterwards. So the Fibre Shed hope in time to re-establish the infrastructure needed and perhaps also it may be possible to grow a species of hemp and flax for both seed and fibre. But as we have an abundance of fleece going to waste at the moment, particularly this year, we wanted to focus our research on what to do with the wheel clip because we do have some capacity for spinning and weaving in this country. So I've been working with South West England Fibre Shed who received funding to try and understand what the challenges were and to create a map of what the possibilities are for small, far, small batch um, clip from farmers who want to process their own yarn. And that material is currently being worked on and will be made into a resource for um, Fibre Shed's members at some point. And at this farm, this uh, image here, this relates to a project that I secured a grant from the USA Fibre Shed last year, because the other um, opportunity and challenge by the Fibre Shed, as well as sourcing materials, is tinctorial dye plants. Because the, a, fiber, a true Fibre Shed product should be dyed with a botanical dye from the region. And as, I, as far as I'm aware, so and please correct me if anybody knows otherwise, there are no commercial growers of tinctorial dye plants in the UK. And what I would say to any farmers here, that MADA, the retail price of MADA that's bought from the growers who grow just on a small scale in their own allotments, at the moment is £80 a kilo. And if it's fresh, going up to £120 a kilo. So, you know, it's, there's definitely a, a financial incentives there. So with this grant, I was able to find three farms to run three pilot projects, um, and they're all different models. I knew because of the pandemic, they had to be within an hour's drive of me. And this is Allside Farm, and this is a picture of Sinead and Adam. They grow well, they grow uh, edible flowers, and so it, they, some of the edible flowers they were growing were already also dye plants, so it made sense for them to scale up and they can now use any excess harvest they have that they can't sell for edible flowers or any that aren't suitable for boxing up for salads to dry them and then that will give them income hopefully over the winter. And there's another farmer who is um, used part of their barley arable field thinking of going into it on a larger scale and another designer who is planted a large dye garden to see what survives to hopefully eventually dye all 450 of her sheep. So. 
So this slide of, um, is a wildlife dyed with plants, and it's really just to give you an indication of the kind of colours that are available with botanical plants, because I think often people imagine that they're kind of washed out and not very vibrant. And um, this colour on the right is madder. The uh, orange colour is coreopsis, which is being grown as part of the trial. And the yellow is from wells. And I have actually brought some dye plants along so you can see what they look like. Um, and then this slide here, I think this is part of the real value of the fibre shed, is that we have connections with London designers as well as with farmers. And there's nothing like getting designers onto the farm to really understand how their purchasing choices impact the land, the animals and the community that look after them. And these people came down from London um, and when, on the way down to, by their own admission, they didn't really know why they were coming. And by the time they left, they were totally blown away. They absolutely understood the impact that particular farming can make on the land. And there is a real hunger among younger generation uh, fashion uh, labels and designers to work in more po in positive ways, as, as we're going to be hearing from Phoebe. So there are the three other fibre sheds in the UK. The South West England Fibre Shed, and Jen here, who's kindly timekeeping, is from the South West Fibre Shed. So if anybody wants to know more about that, she's a good person to ask. Um, it was established by Emma Jane Haig, who would have been on the platform with me here today, were it not for the fact that she's about to have a baby. They recently received funding to create a film, The Fibre Shed, Reconnecting Fashion with Farming, which was shown as part of London Fashion Week digital program and featured on the British Fashion Council Forum Future Fashion Innovation Showcase. And they also got the funding for the Homegrown Feasibility Study that I've mentioned that I've been working on with Emma. Um, and they have an active membership of artisan, weavers, dyers, farmers. Um, so yeah, really worth looking at them if you're in that area. They've got the Northwest England Fibre Shed. I'm going to read this. This is from Justine Aldersley Williams that set it up. Situated in the historic heartland of British textiles, North West England Fibre Shed's first project aims to get natural fibre and dye growing in the region. The founder and dye specialist Justin Aldersley Williams is working in collaboration with fashion designer and judge of the BBC's Great British Showing Bee, Patrick Grant, along with the British Textile Biennale, the Homegrown Home Song Project, and they've planted flax and woad on a disused urban land in Blackburn with the aim of growing the garment in time for this year's October Biennale. And although they're only growing two, what they're hoping to do is to create mid-scale processing infrastructure, learning from that experience. And then finally, we haven't got a map because it's very recent, there's the Wales Fibre Shed. They're in the early stages of creating a collaborative network of regenerative fibre farmers, in particular fibre flats, um, with animal fibres and plant dyes. And their focus is going to be on education, community focus, sharing ideas and skills with the rural community and as a, its hub is on a certified organic farm in the Gow. And again, they will be developing um, an online list of artisans, dyers, weavers and so on. So um, I hope that's given you, I'm sorry, it's a sort of super quick run through each of those subjects I could have spent an hour on, but trying to kind of find a way for those of you to, it's a new concept to, to share what it means. and. Um, for those of you who already know a bit and familiar, to give you a picture of where we are. So um, I think we just got five minutes now for questions from, to go to gala. Okay, I, we've got no time for questions now, but we will have after gala. We started a bit late, we had a bit of a problem with the slides there. So we're, we're gonna have questions after each presentation, so you will have a chance. And hello, I'm Gala. Um, in the audience, this photo was <laughs> part of the Demetrius International Cafe. <laughs> all over the Demetrius stand. <laughs> um, so I'm from Floorhatch Farm. Uh, Floorhatch, the main site, is 200 acres. Um, it's been by dynamic for 40 years. Uh, we farm close to 500 acres now in a pretty uh, large area. It's quite a long way between our sites. Um, I've put this slide together because sometimes I feel like I'm just looks like I'm the only person at Floor Hatch. I'm definitely not. <laughs> this is our farm team. We are mostly female, except for the lovely Robin, who is our herdsman. Um, we're a mixed farm, so we have 35 milking cows. Uh, we've got the 70 head of cattle together, including the stock, and we do some beef. 
Um, we grow all our own silage and we do arable. We've got laying hens, we've got pigs, we've got a farm shop, we've got a butcher. It's very busy. Um, so yeah, that's us. Um, I've always been focused on sheep. I love sheep. I've always loved sheep. I've been at Bull Hatch for nine years, so I've been looking after this flock for nine years. I think we had about 20 when we started. Um, we've now got 65 breeding ewes. I think it's actually the right size for us. I don't think I need to get any bigger, which is quite nice. Because it means I get to know my flock really well. Um, we started with twins, and then I bought Romney's in 2017. We had a hideous dog attack in 2019 and lost half of them, uh, which has really slowed the breeding down because after that there's only three ewe lads born that spring. Um, but the Romney's wool is amazing and um, we've really, I really just, yeah, I don't know, I, I think I'm leaning towards having more Romney's than Clint's now, so that's more the way I'm going. When I first started, we just started doing some wool, so we process the wool with the Natural Fibre Company. They're the only organic processor in the UK. At the moment, they're only processing every two years. They, I guess for production reasons, often have to push the date that they process, which is an absolute nightmare to do any kind of planning around. So they're not going to process now until next year, and I've sold nearly all of my wrong new wool. <laughs> um, that's one of the main challenges. Um, we started doing, for Deborah and my mother, and we started doing dye workshops in 2016, which has been a really good way to educate the public about wool and um, create a bit more of a market for the wool, I guess, and get people on the farm and, and learning about why wool is such a fantastic product and why you should buy wool from the UK and not wool that's been shipped all around the world. Um, so these are the Romneys. Uh, I've, yeah, so you can see that they've got very curly wool, and um, that means it is a lot softer. And we do sheep skins as well, that's one of our main, um, it's, it's quite a big part of our business really, because we sell lambs, and the, the sheep skins are really, that's actually quite an easy part, that's also part of fibre shedding actually. I think that's the best set up thing at the moment, is because there's two organic tanneries, the Welsh organic tannery and the English organic tannery. And they both do an excellent job. Um, the Romney wool, um, I think, so I selected the ewes when I bought them for their wool, and I've selected rounds that I bought for their wool, and I've definitely seen an improvement when we started giving them mineral licks. There's quite a lot of things you can do to increase the, um, the quality of your wool. This is um, all of my experiments in breeding. <laughs> So I often cross for colour. I, I kept the Flynn and the Romney pure, but um, the Jacob lamb is on the bottom left-hand corner. Um, I, they, re they grow really well, and I've had some really nice sheep skins from them. Um, I bought the Shetland ram, the bottom very handsome colour there with his horns, um, hoping he'd throw me some colour. He's not throwing me any colour. <laughs> but the lamb above is one of his, and they've got beautiful wool. Um, and I've just bought this black Romney, who I'm very excited to see what we can get from him next year. Um, this is the sheepskins. It's, the, the only thing about sheepskins is so I take the lambs in the morning, Sarah, and I have to go back to get them in the afternoon and salt them. That's me my daughter salting the sheepskin. Um, and that on the right is the finished ones and the very curly ones are the uncombed knees and they do so very well. I was hoping I could bring one, but I sold them all, so I had to bring that one. Um, yeah, so I sell mostly wool through the farm shop and online. Um, Instagram has been really good for me to sell wool. Um, a lot of people have found the wool that way and, and the directions to the website or come and visit. Um, and this last year I've been working with Phoebe English Studios, um, selling them some of my wool, which is, I mean, that's ideal really. If you could sell one person a lot of wool, it's a hell of a lot easier than selling. 50 people, one ball of war. Um, and we were quite lucky because when Phoebe approached me, I'd actually just had wool process, so I had quite a lot. And um, really one of the problems, I think, for designers and for farmers is because the processing times are so long, you really need a lot of warning. I've had a lot of designers approach me, I guess because I'm part of the fibre chain, 
drugs and say, oh, could I have you know, this amount of wool? And then like, no, because I haven't got it. And there's like, how long will it take? And it's like, well, it's going to be two years because that's when they're processing. So I think yeah, the, the processing side of things is probably one of the biggest challenges. So any questions? Yeah, we, we've got, yeah, would you like to? Yes. Sorry, please. My technical presentation, sorry for this, a naive question. I met someone in uh, Europe, Milan, also. He said to me, 80% of all wool in Europe is burnt. It's not working. And I think, and I talk to people about British wool. So, why, what's the reason for that? You know, we're going to have, you know, using all these fossil fuel derived, uh, you know, I, I would say it's because of uh, a paradigm shift is needed. We've been sold polyester as the answer to all our problems. And actually, if we had to take into account the environmental cost of producing it and the end of life, it would far exceed wool. But the cost to buy it in the shop, because that isn't factored in, is, is way, way less. Also, the wool has the most incredible um, properties. It's hydrophilic, it releases heat as it dries. I mean, when you wear something polyester, it does not release heat as you dry, so you get chilly. Um, and I, I think we've had a lack, we've definitely had a lack of investment in wool. And the British Wool Board have been very focused on merino, which is not helpful. And we've also had a situation that since the 1950s, when originally the farmer would get a really good amount of money for the wool kit, somebody um, told me recently their grandfather in the 1950s got enough money for his wool kit to pay the rent for the whole year. Um, but the, the cost of meat has gone up in, exponentially, and as the cost of meat has gone up, the cost of fleece has gone down, and that's also because farmers are breeding for meat, not for fleece. But I think the person probably could tell you answer this best, to be honest, is Jen, who's sitting in the front here. So I don't know if you want to um, say something. No, I can say there's a negative correlation when you select meat to go down. So since is the lower the micron, the less itchy or hairy it will be and the finer the, the wool. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so 18 microns and below is considered wearable next to your skin. Most British breeds might be around 30 to 35. So, you know, that isn't what you want to be wearing. That's why Merino is generally 18 or it goes right down to 11 microns, which is But we have so also... Next to skin, yeah. If you, choose, if you choose to go lower than your micron, And there is also outerwear. I mean, we've just forgotten about the, the, how wonderful outerwear is. And also, this whole sort of obsession about wearing jumpers next to the skin with nothing underneath it. And I've got, I love jumpers that you can put over that, are, you know, will last forever. You know, there's, there's another question over here. Do you... Yeah, question could be on the microphone. So I'm also down to about 30 microns. So you're more selected. Uh, uh, should be invested. I don't actually know, but um, at the end, we've got... Uh, talk from Harriet Miller and she has been micron testing and our wool's not that dissimilar. It's quite expensive, I think. Yeah, it, it, yeah I mean, it is, it is an option. It's not what most farmers do. So there is the uh, European um, wool testing authority that's based on accuracy. Uh, you can approach them. It's not a standard thing. And when I first did ours, they tried to charge me £25 per sample. Anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere that grows merinos, they're paying a dollar, dollar ten. So there's a massive difference. But that is to do with demand for that service. Um, there is companies that you sell through different outlets that they will do that test for you. So as an example, our um, Shetland, Romney, Crosslands, they're down to 26 because that's what we 
And it, it is something that I think the fiber shed could do is to buy a micron part because it's not that expensive, and then to share it across regions. Yeah, so we've been, yeah. So we've been talking about that for Southwest. So that's something. It's one of one of our funding bids at some point. Yeah. Would you? Um, so I went to, well I started using Crystalix, I've, I've, they actually last such a long time, I bought a time and I've still got them. <laughs> I'm actually planning on bolusing, um, because I think I don't, you just don't need all the extra, you know, the, 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 my cheaper on like purple days, I don't need all the extra molasses, but um, yeah, because I've got them, I'm still using them. Well, I'm not bolusing at the moment, so... Well, I, oh, um, I mean, I know that we our ground is short in selenium and cobalt, so definitely those, and I'll, and I'll look into it more, what I can get into them. Yeah. There's just one last question over here. Yeah. Well, it's so literally, they, so the actual processing, I think, takes about 12 weeks. So when they actually start doing it, that's how long it will be until you get your wall back. But they, I think because there isn't much demand for organic processing, they're sort of bulking it together because they have to wash all of the machines before they run that organic clip. So they do, I think they do the, the organic and then they do the herd bit afterwards. And there are, so um, Harriet did look into, into it for me and there are places that do the, the organic process is separately but we get our wool worsted so it's it's comb to line up all the fibers and there's not an organic certified comb person <laughs> and i've just had blankets processed and they're organic certified to the point of finishing and the finishers just dropped their certification so the finishing can't so they can't be fully certified otherwise they can be um, so we just we're in a bit of a race against time in terms of if we want the processing to keep going and we want people to hold, you know, keep certifying organically, we need to use their services because for a lot of people I think it's becoming, they just, why am I paying for this organic certification when there's not the demand? And it, I would just say that um, in the research that Emma and I did looking at all the mills around the country, there is a, um, a changing uh, attitude of some of the bigger mills that are considering doing smaller batches because they're not getting the quantity because of Brexit. They're, not having the demand from abroad so if you are interested in processing there's opportunities now that there were perhaps last year um, can we come to you after clara because we'll have time for questions now but i'm aware that we're running over so clara <coughs> So I'm just going to introduce you um, Phoebe English Studios. So Phoebe English Studios is a London-based fashion label uh, that's been running for the past 10 years. And the main focus recently for the studio has been to shift from traditional extracting methods to put in place a working system that would preserve and enhance the natural system. So um, putting more back in than we took out, basically. So this project we've been working on um, has been funded by the Business of Fashion, Textile and Technology. It uh, was originally called Remodeling Fashion. Um, and basically it was, the aim of the project was to practi practically redefine what regenerative design means for a fashion studio. And so understanding how we can um, transition from sustainable intentions to actual regenerative outcomes um, and identifying how our design process in the studio can actively support and be connected to improving biodiversity, soil health um, and carbon sequestration methods by working regionally um, with farmers and positive supply networks. So here is the overview map of the full supply network uh, we've been using to achieve development of one particular product in one category. Um, yeah, so here is, it's really showing the regionality 
and the intended um, to reduce the distance of an entire um, supply network. So it starts with our studio based in London and then goes to the Plohaj farm where we source the wool from Gala from Kalvo uh, Mishi. Um, and then going to the natural fiber company based in Cornwall uh, where the wool has been organically processed that we just uh, mentioned. Then Barbara husband was our knitter and has been developing swatches uh, based in Kent. And then uh, Deborah, which has been doing the natural dyes for the yarn. Um, and I've also included uh, the location of some of the pigments that Deborah used, which were based in the Guernsey Island. So these are the initial swatch trials that have been knitted by, by Barbara and Lita. Um, so it's just to show you the different type of texture and sort of results you can achieve with one end, so just one yarn or two ends uh, with two yarns to give different um, sort of weight and texture. But really the idea here was to, within the product development, to, to really not denaturalize the beautiful natural properties of, of the wool itself um, and try to res really respect um, the raw materials. And here you can see the um, recognized dye points that we have been using, that Deborah has been uh, using to do the trials on the wool arms. So as Deborah was, was mentioning before, the idea of using natural dyes is to really shift from synthetic dyes and the chemical inputs that are present in these dyes and how they can be released into waterways and pollute our environments and really have an impact on biodiversity but also on our on health, um, on skin. Um, so here we have used Japanese indigo that came from the Guernsey Island where the pigments have been grown in the UK um, on a commercial scale for, for the first time. I think so. um, and in the middle you can see the wild plant which is given very strong and beautiful yellow uh, color. And then next to it is the world. So originally we wanted to use world to achieve a, a blue color. But again, um, regarding the season, the natural cycles, the availability of the plant itself, and we uh, realized that recently the last wood farm on a commercial scale has um, been closing down. So we couldn't find any wood pigment at that time of year to achieve the blue, which is why we went back to the Japanese indigo instead. And here you can see the result of the different colors. So on your left is the weld, uh, which gives these yellow tones. And on the right is the indigo result, which is achieving a very similar result uh, from what weld could have looked like too. And here you can see the final, the final swatch that's been developed um, by Barbara, and which can take be taken further on to be developed into a product or a garment. But as you can realize, this is a, a slow process, so that's the current state we are at the moment. But the idea is to develop it into probably a hat and a jumper. Okay, yeah. I think what's uh, particularly interesting about Phoebe English Studios, there's been a lot of um, hand knitters, hand dyers, hand spinners, particularly with the Weavers Guild, Spinners, Weavers and Dyers Guild, who've been keeping this amazing tradition alive, and we're really, really grateful for them, but they have a very particular aesthetic, and the idea of this project is to use natural dyes and natural fabrics that were generatively sourced, but that don't compromise the aesthetic of the studio, so that for us is a really important um, step. So um, I know there was a question there. Just, would you like to ask that before we move on to questions for Clara? Um, you were the manager of the sheep for sheep that was taken from the sheep that was made for products like jacket on, the sheep that was made for 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 the 
Definitely not. <laughs> I think it, it probably really depends how fine you're going with your wool, how you're grazing your sheep. I mean, our, our lambs and our ewes are mostly in electric fences, so they're not getting too tangled up with too many brambles or other vegetable matters. Um, and I think if they've got a hell, if yeah, I mean, I can always comment about how clean our sheep are, but I'm not really sure why. I mean, I think that one of the main things is is trying not to use spray markers too much, because anything, especially with the organic processing, it's very hard to get out. So like, I had to. I, there was a there was like a few intact ram lambs I had to put spray on last year, and their skins. I had their skins processed anyway, because we have some strange people who like them with marks on. <laughs> And they, like, they just couldn't get the blue out, so they're still blue. And obviously when you shear the fish, you can take that bit out, but that's a waste of wool, really, to be taking that, that dive out. Yeah. So I'm just going um, to, I'm aware that we're sort of time's racing out. Is there any questions for Clara? Anybody? Questions from the floor? Um, so I have a question from Clara. Um, do you think there's an interest in regenerative design and fashion generally? Um, is that something you'll see? Yeah, I think it's, it's emerging alongside the regenerative agriculture movement, but I think there's still a really big language and knowledge barrier between designers and farmers, for example. Um, so it's, it's really about being able to, to share this knowledge and to, to educate people about that, even for ourselves, because it's been a re-educating process for us to even be able to, to go on the farm to meet the people that are part about this whole supply network and, and we learn about, about all of these processes from being connected in, in a circular way rather than usually being very linear. You know, the designer is at the end of the chain and the farm is at the beginning, but you rarely meet and then connect with each other. And um, I just wondered if you could say a little bit about why you um, and the PV Design Studio decided to partner with Fib Fiber Shares. Yeah, so while I think originally Phoebe um, got introduced to fiber shed at the Bokona uh, Regenerative uh, Agriculture Weekend in 2019, but really the, the idea of um, being connected to, to positive input into our natural system as an urban based design is really what fiber shed has allowed us to, to be able to, to work on and to. Um, it's pretty much the only system that we've found that can support positive intentions and full transparency uh, within the bioregion. And, and I know that you're part of a sort of, I think it's 300 designers on a big WhatsApp group of designers in London who are interested in regenerative farming and changing the whole paradigm of the fashion industry. Do you feel like farmers here might be considering improving their sheep and trying to develop their own yarn, that there's an interest wider from designers, independent labels for that sort of um, product? Yeah, yeah, I think, um, as you said, labeling and certification, I think is really important because we can see it a lot in food, like food are labeled way more clearly than in fashion. Fashion is quite a mystery, it's very murky still, and being able to, to have a, a label that can show full transparency is really important. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I mean, that, that is one of the ideas of the Fibre Shed is to have the certification, which I've been working on the Southwest Fibre Shed certification with Emma, and um, Northwest have adopted it, and the Southwest, I think, um, has been going for a few months now, the, the labelling down there, um, and certainly we will be using that in the South East as well. And that does give um, the person that's buying an indication of whether the natural dyes were used, whether the fiber was produced regeneratively and so on. Um, and I would, what I would say is that we're very early days, so um, yeah. it's small steps and we're on a steep learning curve. But um, the, the, uh, the idea is that ultimately, like the USA, we would actually be able to produce um, products, garments that are local to the Southeast region with local labor, local dyes and local fibers um, that actually have a zero carbon, net zero carbon, which is what they're managing to do in California. So um, I've got a presentation from Harriet, who's not with us today, um, and we wanted to share because she's actually an international knitwear designer who's been working in design for the last 25 years and has set up um, a flock of sheep 
where she's trying to bring the, somebody else about microphone earlier. She's bringing the microphone count down of her Romneys. We've actually got some of her role here as well as Gladys. Um, and she's sent us some slides and a presentation for me to talk through. So you'll have to forgive me for reading this because this isn't my project. But um, I think it would make sense now to go on to that. Yeah. Um, but before we do that, is there any last questions? Because we're going to finish with this. Yeah. Uh, I just want to know if there are any largest here that have no say from my experience from being director of the Fibre Show and having emails, there is a lot of interest. They don't really know what it means. There's a huge education gap. And what, what still happens is people come to me and they say, we want to get regenerative wool. Can we have it like next week? And you know, the education is to say, well, actually, you need to find a fibre farmer and you need to work with them. You need to decide what kind of wool you need, what base colour you want, where you're going to get the dyes from. So it's getting them to understand it isn't something you can just snap your fingers and get. I mean, if you want to say yeah, no, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. It's, it's really having the full understanding and going along the seasons of nature and not the seasons of fashion that we usually used to work on, you know, fashion weeks, creating four collections a year. We really need to, to go back to a way more connected way to the materials themselves and each component that goes into the process. Because it's really about acknowledging each of the components, I think, and that's, that's what designers should be more aware of. And that, but also the UK processing is a lot more expensive. Than, so, like, with, I mean, the organic and, and small scale processing here is very expensive to the point I'm paying the same amount of money to have my wool processed as most people are buying it wholesale. So I can't charge the price that I'm paying to have it processed. I have to put, charge, put something on top of it. And even the larger scale mills will be a lot more expensive than it is to ship all to China, which is obviously mad, but that is how it is at the moment. So that sometimes they want to do it, but they're not necessarily willing to pay the extra money or find out enough about it. And I guess even us as a, as a small business, we've been able to work with you guys thanks to a funding as well, but in the future, how do we put this, this continue the Way of I mean, I, I think fiber shade is part of a whole paradigm shift, thinking about how we think about clothes and fashion and valuing things and wearing things longer and upcycling. And that has to be part of it because we can never compete with the fashion industry as it stands. So it is a, a whole shifted paradigm. And that's partly our goal in fiber shade of the film that um, Southwest Fiber Shed did and um, the work that we do doing articles and talks is to try and get people to rethink the real cost of their clothing. So, um, Laura, if you could do the slides for this one, we'll just yes, um, we'll just go through um, this to the right turn the page. So, um, this is a project. This is Harriet. This is Lamb. It's on the North Downs. Harriet is actually in Milan at the moment. Um, she's doing a collection, and unfortunately, dates got changed, so she uh, wasn't able to be here. So she's been working as a knitwear design director for global luxury, luxury fashion brands for over, oh, sorry, 16 years. And her clients include Louis Vuitton, Calvin Klein, Burberry and Celine. And over the past two and a half years with her partner Will, who's a livestock farmer, they've developed lamb, food and fibre. And their aim is to create a regional regenerative fibre and fashion system modelled on the fibre share principles. And the uniqueness of her project is that it's able to manage the complete supply chain from the fibre source through um, processing of the fibre and develop um, a regional climate beneficial knitwear connection for high-end brands on a small commercial scale with bespoke yarns and garments um, which they're designing to the spec of a particular company or designer. So the fashion wear knit, knit industry, knitwear industry has a global supply chain with over 10 processes from fibre to finished fashion project, and the majority of wool from the commercial fashion industry, as people have mentioned here, um, is produced in the Southern Hemisphere, focused on fibres with a low micron count, and with yarn, spun and garments manufactured mainly in Europe and the Far East due to technical manufacturing facilities, and the final product then distributed locally. 
And despite the industry awash with organic and sustainability accreditations and certifications, there's a lack of traceability, provenance, and substantial carbon footprint due to this global supply chain. So I would just say at this point, quite typically, people who come on our workshops are buying wool. It's 100% wool, and for that we applaud them. But what they don't realize is it's often come from Australia. It goes to China to be processed, back to Australia to be packaged, over to the UK to a middle person, the middle man, woman, and then it's distributed to a shop, and then to them, at half the price that Gala can process um, the, the floor hatch block. And it really brings home, you know, we're really not calculating in the real cost of, of our wool. So despite, as I say, we now find, as I learn now, Harriet's now saying, we now find ourselves at a pivotal point and believe a viable solution for the future can be found within the development of regenerative and regional fibre and fashion systems. So based in North Kent, they are passionate about centralising the project around dual purpose native breeds of Kent Romney for both meat and fibre. They maintain a young flock of 450 breeding ewes practising high welfare husbandry to ensure the, high, the lowest possible micron count and good quality meat from the breed. And micron testing over the past two years has displayed clear results of fibre improvement. Healthy, low-stress animals on diverse forage-based diets have shown within their system to produce a higher quality of wool. And I know this is something that Jen particularly can speak to as well. If anybody wants to speak to her, that's what I offer you. <laughs> the sheep are managed in a regenerative system, silver pasture, utilising brassica cover crops, moth grazing through new grass layers, together with managing permanent pastures and flower meadows to increase and encourage biodiversity. The permanent pastures are managed in a rotation with both native breed Sussex cattle and mobile, um, Sussex, uh, mobile poultry units. They aim to average four kilos of fleece per ewe per year, with best ewes yielding four kilos of fleece of fleece a first year and two kilos a second clip. And the fleece is transported to a scouring processor twice a year in line with shearing dates. So the Romneys are sheared twice a year if conditions allow. The first year First year typically for worsted yarn due to the long staple length, a minimum length of 7.5 centimetres is required to worsted spin, and the second year for woolen spinning is a shorter fibre. And I think this is this really brings home to me why it's important to work with the designers so you know whether there's a demand for woolen spun or worsted spun and what kind of quality you put, they're looking for because it's so depressing when fibres farmers spend a lot of money and time producing something but they haven't found who actually wants that, and then it makes everybody feel like they're not doing, you know, there's no point in doing it. So there's a strict quality control of all fibre, which is separated and packaged by age at shearing. Alongside the Romney flock, last year, Harriet and Will introduced a nucleus flock of pedigree breeding superfine Australian merinos solely for wool production, averaging a micron count of the 15 to 16, 16 microns, which rivals the finest produced in the southern, southern hemisphere. And as was said before, this is predominantly used for very fine next to skin base layer garments. And as displayed on the slide, you can see the distinct qualities of the fibre, bright white in colour, luster and density. And in contrast to the wrong knee, the quality of the fleece does not decline over the age of the animal. Therefore, all weathers, breeding and non-breeding use are attained within the flock. Um, and with working on a breeding programme, they aim to have a flock which parallels that of the wrong knees for wool production. Experienced high welfare biosecure shearers are paramount to the process. Strict piece sorting, selection, and skirting is vital. And the merino fleece is not sprayed or marked, instead, spayed or marked. Instead, collars are used at lambing to maintain the clean quality of the pieces. And in contrast to the Romneys, they're she sheared roughly every, five, every eight months. Um, the fibres processed in the following stages scouring, combing, spinning, dyeing, and knitting into final products. And each processing stage of processing can generate a loss of fibre between 10 to 30 percent. It's all scoured in Bradford in two separate lots depending on the clip and then the fibre is then distributed to the different spinners and the spinning technique is selected according to the clip, quality, length of fibre and the specific yarn design. The yarns are designed bespoke to the client in hand and bespoke yarns are niche within the fashion industry. The general practice industry standards are working from large stock service yarns produced in bulk supply from large mills for immediate sampling and production. So that goes back to what we were saying before. This is where working with um, British farmers is a challenge sometimes for designers. Lamb offers a niche bespoke yarn design service 
producing worsted yarn, woolen yarn, and hand spun yarns in collaboration with the creative direction of the client, and all the yarns produce small scale mills in the north of England within a 150 mile radius of the farm. The yarn is produced as a white or raw white product or naturally dyed organic yarn. And Lamb is working with the Fiber Shed on a project that I got funding for from America. A hundred, um, it's called 100 Botanical Dye Gardens, but it's actually started it as working with three dye gardens to establish pilot dyes, dye projects, um, to see if we can grow dye plants commercially in the country. The dye garden that Lamb have consists of 15 species of plants to produce a range of colours to hand dye their fibres. And um, I, they received mentoring and I designed, helped them design a small dye garden, well, not so small dye garden. Um, and they are hoping eventually to be able to dye all 450 pieces that they have from the uh, dye plants that they produce. The fine knitted garments are produced by three manufacturers in the UK on both hand and electronic machines. And this year, Lamb has started to source fibre from other local farms farming regeneratively to meet increased demand and to purchase naturally coloured Hebridean fibre in order to make blended melange colour yarns of natural tones. They hope as the project grows, there will be increased demand to collaborate and work with more independent farms. Um, and I think what's really exciting about this project is that Harriet has access to all the luxury brands and to really move things within the fashion industry. She works in Italy um, on the continent, but also works closely with the mills here. And she's very open to talking about the process and to um, sharing the knowledge and information that um, she's learnt in, in the process of doing this. So, um, yeah, I think the fact that it's a scalable model and it's not looking towards sort of big industry, but something that's farm scale is really exciting. Um, so, uh, Harriet has a, a website, Harriet will have a website, which is LAM, and uh, if you want some more information, I would suggest visiting their website, that's beautiful photography. Just can see how we're doing for time. One minute left, okay. So, um, there isn't time for questions now, but we will be hanging around, so if there's anything you want to come and ask us, please do. The Fiber Shed book by Rebecca Burgess, which we have copies of, our own personal copies here, you're welcome to have a look at and it's on sale from Chelsea Green Books and the other bookshop here. I really recommend it. Um, after you've read it, you'll never be able to wear synthetic fleece again. Um, yeah. um, we've also got some handy, these are some examples of Harriet's wool here, and fleeces and so on from Claw Hatch. And I bought some dye plants here for you to have a look at, Madder and Weld, and also just a sample of, a random sample, I have to say, of um, wool that I've done. So um, I just wanted to finish with a quote from Robin Hall Kimmerer, who is Professor of Forest Biology at Uni um, New York State University. Imagine, imagination is one of our most powerful tools. What we imagine, we can become. Thank you.